Let me just run this thing to the bottom. All right, there's a few news articles that I thought were fun. This one we were just talking about, and I think it's very interesting. We've been looking in our Android apps for hard-coded passwords and for locally stored login passwords, but the other thing you might find in there is API keys. And somebody said they found an API key in that Iowa voting app that we were looking at. So here's a company a couple of years ago that tried this, and they found Twitter keys and Urban Airship and Flickr and WeChat keys and Dropbox keys. So that sounds like fun. So we just need to figure out what to grep for to find it. But from his example, it looks like you just grep for API key. Um, his example is here. And this just is an XML stored string with, I don't know why the ads are filling my whole screen, but they like to do that. Um, and so it just says AWS key, an AWS secret. So if they're going to give it a name like that, that makes it easy for us to find. So anyway, uh, that would be handy. Because if they don't give it a name like that, I don't know how we're going to find this completely random junk here. Anyway, um, so it'd be fun if we can find some API keys. That would be the next exciting thing to find in apps. Yeah, you authenticate to the service. You sign up. You, you can connect, authenticate to Google, authenticate to Amazon. That's like a password. You send that key up with API requests. It's like the cookie. So, I mean, if you're not supposed to expose it. You're not supposed to hard code it in an app, just like a password, but a lot of people do. So, um, the Nevada is apparently going to use Google Forms instead of using an Android app. And people are saying, wait a minute, that's not a whole lot better. So, we'll see if they manage to mess up. I saw Trump at a rally having great time saying the Democrats are idiots. They don't even know what they're doing. They can't even count the votes. And unfortunately, it's true, but you know, <laughs> that's why it's not a good look to not even be able to count the votes. I found the airship key in the HD app. Me? Yes, yeah, sending it right up. Absolutely. Let's see it. Good. What's HD? Home Depot. Oh, good. Hey, that's awesome. Let's see it. What is Airship anyway? Some kind of logging thing? Neat. Yeah, let's see it. So good. Um, so this is Azurea. Azurea is awesome. Um, she's a security researcher and does a lot of really hardcore technical stuff. Uh, she does a whole bunch of stuff about ARM. And here she is talking about the ARM trust zone. Now, back in the old days, there was ring 0, 1, 2, and 3. And ring zero is kernel mode, and those are all the commands in the processor. And ring three is user land that cannot have direct access to the hardware. But that's like 15 years out of date. Now there's ring minus one, which is hardware-assisted virtualization, the hypervisor, called EL2. And now there's a new thing called a secure environment, where you can have processes going on that the processor can't directly reach. This is sort of like the secure enclave but it's another layer of processing. He talks about how it works. So now the entire previous security model is essentially virtualized. And this is controlled by the secure monitor and there's secrets over here that can't be accessed there. And the point of this is I think this can hopefully resist those attacks like Spectre and Meltdown, which showed that the barrier between these turned out to be more porous than people thought it was. And you could actually find secrets you weren't supposed to be able to see by deducing them from cache contents. So this is ARM's improvement to the hardware to have yet another hardware place to hide your stuff. And she's explaining how it works and everything. And this is, of course, uh, the wave of the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We used it uh, uh, in 127. We were using some Azurea Labs um, for a while. She uses Kimu to emulate ARM. And I found it didn't work very well. So I switched to real hardware ARM. Um, the Kimu things were pretty miserable. And I, uh, what I found really works is uh, real Raspberry Pis and real iPhones for ARM. But um, she does a lot of labs in Kimu, and she managed to get it working. If you download her exact virtual machine, her labs will work. But when I tried to do variations, they didn't work, and I was very unsuccessful with Kimu. Kimu emulates ARM, but I spent a lot of, a lot, most of last semester trying to get it to work, and it's just not reliable enough. Real hardware works a whole lot better if you want to learn ARM attacks. So this guy has this thing straight out of science fiction. He can totally steal a car. And this is a relay attack. Uh, this is very simple. He has an accomplice that's near the guy that has the fob. So he walks up to the car and receives the signal from the car, relays it over another wavelength to the other guy, which sends it to the fob, which then sends it back. So, you know, he can, but he's not, the real owner is not near the car but he's able to relay the signals as if you were and get in the car and start it and everything. And they say a lot of luxury cars are being stolen this way. It's a pretty devastating attack. And so you, he's the, it, he makes little gadgets and this guy sells gadgets. 
He says, I don't want to go to jail for being a car thief, so I don't steal cars. I just tell these gadgets to other people who then steal cars. I'm not sure that's going to get him off in court. But anyway, you just carry a little thing like this, and you can get in. Um, so those wireless entry things, there's a whole bunch of videos of guys walking through garages stealing cars and stuff, and a lot of rumors about these gadgets, and more and more it appears to be true. So um, now this is supposedly the evidence, although we still don't have any evidence. Remember, about a year ago, the U.S. government said, don't use any Huawei because the Chinese government will see it. And now they're claiming they actually have evidence that shows that the Huawei is, has a Kalia-like Chinese backdoor in, and the Chinese government can see whatever goes through a Huawei switch. So not much proof has really come out, but more and more is leaking out of exactly why they did that, that supposedly there is some basis. It wasn't just racism and paranoia. And in the same sense, this is an old attack, but now with more documents have leaked out about it. Crypto AG made the hardware encryption used by banks and everybody for like 20 years. And it was owned by the CIA and backdoored by the CIA and everybody's secrets were leaking to the CIA for like three decades. And military and governments all over the world was using this thing. It came from Switzerland, but it was secretly owned by the CIA. It's bloody awesome. But this, did, this facts about this came out 10 years ago or more maybe 20 years ago, but now just some proof came out, some documents backing it up, and people figured it out. Anyway, um, that's why the hardware, the encryption people are always murder on law enforcement backdoors, because this has been tried many times, and every time it's turned out to be a disaster. Anyway, so we're up to here, um, which, oh, let me just talk about the uh, projects and such. So here's the schedule. And we are here at 2.12. So we're going to start attacking Android applications, have a couple more chapters about Android, and then we're going to move on to um, iOS. I might rearrange these lectures a little, probably not. Anyway, the point is I want to talk about the projects. So I just put 501 back up, and I'll demonstrate it today. I found out what the problem with it was, and I'll probably put up 502. But the main thing I did was add more iPhone projects. So I'll talk about them later. But now I've got all the uh, logging, local storage, and plain text transmission for iPhones and a whole bunch of demonstrations. And this is the stuff I showed you guys three weeks ago, a whole bunch of, because now a month has expired. So I'm willing to go public with a whole bunch of those apps. So we're going to use a whole series of real apps that are vulnerable and just find the same kind of vulnerabilities in these apps that we found in Android. So, um, and these two, you can do without a jailbroken iPhone. You can do them with your home iPhone, any iPhone. This one, you need a jailbroken iPhone, so I made it extra credit. The jailbreaking was giving us trouble, and um, now it's working. I, the man that wrote CheckRain came in a couple days ago and showed me what was wrong. The latest version of CheckRain is broken. You have to go back and use the previous version, and then it works. So we can now totally do this stuff. And I'll, um, my may, I mean, I've ordered a whole bunch more iPhones, so we'll see what happens. I might make everything that requires a jailbroken iPhone extra credit if it turns out not enough people can get it. I might have enough phones that I can loan them and sell them and stuff and everybody can have them. We'll see what happens. I've got like another five or six coming in and I'll keep them coming because now we're having great success. Any phone I buy that's in the right zone, I'm only buying five S's and six, really pretty much five S's because they're cheapest and they all work. So I think we're in pretty good shape. And so let me, um, I share a chat message. Uh, where are you getting? Oh, I, uh, User interaction, third-party software. Okay, yeah, okay. I just um, I get them. Well, I get them at Swappa. That's a good point. You might just buy your own. If you go to Swappa, this is where I get cheap iPhones, and it's working just fine. So Swappa, iPhones, and you can totally get iPhone 6s. I found a bunch. Yep, here's iPhone 6s, 71 bucks. But when I was there yesterday, there were ones for like 30 and 40 bucks. Maybe I bought all the cheap ones. The prices change frequently. So I recommend this. I'm going to put it in my news links. Swappa is the place I get used iPhones. And it's working very well. And I think you just have to check every day. Because I bought all the cheap ones. And then I tried next week. And there were a bunch more cheap ones. And now there aren't any more cheap ones. I think this is just individual people selling their phone. So they come in the mail in a few days. And it's, you, they go down to like 35 bucks. I think the average I'm paying is about 50. So anyway. You can get an old phone there if you want one, but I will have loaners in the lab and stuff, so you can do it here if you don't want to bother buying a special phone. But a jailbroken iPhone is a wonderful thing. Everyone should have one. So, all right. So uh, we'll start talking about the Android security model, and this will be demonstrating Drozer 
and Civ, which is that project there where you get to see deeply into Android internals. And I found this very helpful for understanding Android, but not very helpful from serious security testing because I've never found any apps that actually make these mistakes. It seemed, I, I'm, anyway, we have one demo app you can see making these mistakes, but I have not found any other apps to test making these errors. So, so far, the other errors are much simpler. So, you have your Android app, and the app runs in a, a container at a certain privilege level, and then it has communications to the internet server. So, you could um, defeat the sandbox. So, you get to see the private data for that app. If you could get root or have some other kind of exploit on the device, typically root exploit is what you need, you could have a malicious app on the app device, which does not break the sandbox, but sends signals from one app to another called intents on the device. And that won't work unless the app actually handles intents unsafely or lets intents in, but some of them could do that. Then you can, of course, have physical access to the device. Somebody steals your phone, they could jailbreak it and steal the secrets that are stored on the phone, which is why I'm complaining about storage of local passwords and such. And uh, there could be other vulnerabilities in the app, like the one we did in Android, there was a file explorer app that just ran an http server and shared all your files over the local network that's a that's a whole new mistake to make that's not one of these fundamental ones your app could do something else stupid um so if the the, the communications is of course easy to hack in a lot of ways you can man in the middle it you can use art poisoning to redirect the traffic you could host a malicious wireless network um so if they're not like using proper https where they encrypt everything and verify the certificate, then you can totally hijack and alter the traffic. Um, you can tack into the server at the other end of the API. The APIs are often very vulnerable, as several of the apps we've seen, like GenieMD, and that Equity Pandit has a terrible API with ridiculous flaws. So that's quite common. They compromise servers, and then the server uh, steal the passwords right off the server or put malware on the server, which comes down to the client. Um, all right, so here's the security model. The um, structure of Android apps, every Android app has these four things. Activities are the screens you can see, like the splash page and the login screen. Broadcast receivers are like listening network ports. They're not listening on a TCP port. It's a more abstract concept than that. It's listening for a signal coming from other apps, which is called an intent, which is like a local network packet, but it is formatted differently, sort of like XML. Uh, then there are services which offer services to other apps, and there's content providers which are databases storing data. And the interesting thing is in old versions of Android before API 17, which is now pretty old, um, this was all content providers are exported by default. Exported things are things that are visible to other apps. It would be more secure not to export anything, but the idea was if you have a database, you intend that to be available for every app on the phone, which in retrospect was not that brilliant an idea. And so some a bunch of older apps on older phones were exporting all their data to everybody by accident. Now that's not that common. So there's a thing called the target SDK version when you compile an app that says the publishing of components, there's also the compile and the min SDK version. These are what you put in an app and it determines which phones will be allowed to have it. Uh, some of you doing the projects would get a message saying you can't put this app on your phone. And this is what it means. It's looking at the SDK version and saying your OS is outside the allowed range. Of, um, of software, of uh, SDK and Science Software Development Kit. You have, your Android is too old to run a modern app. This is an old image um, showing the distribution of apps, but as we said, a lot of people are running very old Androids, like five and six and even four, um, and therefore uh, that makes them very vulnerable for a lot of these things. Um, App, app, Apple, uh, Google stopped updating this because they're being humiliated by the fragmentation of Android and they said, why should we publish the information that hurts us? And in case you feel like Google is just evil, Apple did the same thing. Apple quit reporting sales for iPhones a couple of years ago because they were bragging about them because they were great. And then they stopped talking about it. So obviously they're not great. I think Apple suffers the same as Facebook. Everybody on earth has one, so you can't increase your sales anymore. <laughs> and Facebook has, I think, 2 billion users there aren't very many more people you could possibly get. <laughs> I think Apple has the same problem. Anyway, um, so here's how you export components. In the um, Android manifest file, you just specify a receiver and you make export it equals true. So now this broadcast receiver is listening to signals from other apps. And if you don't specify anything, uh, then it will be exported implicitly for um, services on the older version. So an intent filter 
means you are listening for a certain kind of signal, and that comes in down here. Um, someplace, yeah, type equals image slash star. That is like the um, scheme in front of a URL. You have HTTP or HTTPS, or you can have mail to or telnet. So that's the first few characters of a request determines where it should go. And this image slash star means it'll run images. Right. Yeah, you need a power? Um, yeah, here, I'll, move, I'll move this one back here. Yeah, I got one I can move back here. There, let's speed up a few in front. Good power is like really important. I spend a lot of my life hunting for power at places like the airport. Anyway, um, so Drozer has this attack surface module that will show you what's exported, which is pretty nice. So this app has activities, broadcast, content providers, but no services exported. And so let me uh, go to the project and show you some of this stuff live because I got it working. Now, the reason I took down this project for a while was because it was not working. And I figured out what the problem is, which is what I kind of suspected it was. This project requires you to run a Drozer agent and a Drozer server, and that works fine. But then you install this app called Civ, which is a demonstration app that stores passwords, and that app is written in ARM code, not in x86 code. So you have to have an ARM translation library. And the previous version I'd written up here pointed you to like an ARM 4.4, translation library that only worked on Android 4.4, but we're now using older, later versions of Android and it didn't work. So the main update I did here was I said, you probably ought to use a more recent Android. What I found is uh, the best thing that works is this one. For this project, I'm using a Google Nexus 6 running Android 8. I found that the older versions like Android 5 and Android 6 did not work well. So make an emulator running Android 8 to do this project. And then it will work pretty well. You use an emulator using Android 8, and you have to find the right um, version of the translation library. So I put this in the project, and I'll open it up there where I can blow it up for the online viewers. Um, you, when you put on the translation library, which is, there it is, you have to git clone the whole thing. I put it on a Mac, but you can just download and unzip a git library on a PC if you like. And then you'll find in this ARM translation package folder, a whole series of ARM translation libraries, and they go up to version 8, 6, 5.1, and 4. So I found if I run Android 8 and I use the version of the library for Android 8, everything works. If you use older stuff, it tends to crash all the time and it's frustrating. So let me demonstrate some of this stuff. This M501 is, uh, this is the standard tutorial for Drozer. And Drozer is like Metasploit for Android. Um, so, what you do is you download Drozer, which is here, and you install some stuff with Python, and then you get download this thing called the Drozer Agent. And you connect to your Android. So, I've got an Android phone here. This is my phone running Android 8. Let me go to home. All right. And um, I've got a thing called the Drozer Agent, and I put it on just this way. You download the Drozer Agent, and then you just do ADB connect to your phone. And then you do ADB install. You just push the APK up. You could also just drag and drop the APK the same way you've done with other apps. So this puts this Drozer agent on the phone. So I start the Drozer agent, and it's already on. The Drozer agent is listening on 31415. The Drozer agent is like having malware on the phone, which is very common. I now, because you can control the Drozer agent from Kali, or from whatever. We're using Kali, but you can use whatever. So I can exit here. <coughs> All right, and make this bigger. All right, so clear. Let's play some games with Drozer. So you do have to forward a port. This ADB forward will forward port 31415 on the phone back to 31415 on the local system so Drozer can find it. Because this server is listening on the Android device, not on my local system. But if I'm connected with Android Debug Bridge, I can connect the two, and now it's listening on my local system on the same port number. So now I launch the agent and get it started listening. And now I can do Drozer console connect. And this gives me another way to control the phone. The, what we've done before is use ADB. And by the way, you can do everything with ADB. There are command line commands on the phone to do everything. Drozer is just a convenience to show you things like intents and databases and receivers. In principle, there are long ADB commands that do it all. 
but Drozier is a little bit classier, and the, your book is written by the author of Drozier, and it's pretty awesome. So if you do help, you see a bunch of commands, help command, and here's some stuff, there's intents and so on. Um, all right, so Drozier is running, and so we can do help shell. And it'll tell us that we can actually execute commands in the shell with bang. So I could do bang, who am I? And this goes out of Drozer and finds out who I am and then comes back. So this is not immensely exciting, but you can run shell commands here, just like you could by typing ADB shell. And we did this before when pulling apps off the phone, ADB shell, PM list packages, and so on. Um, ADB shell could in principle do everything. So if I do um, list, now I have a DS prompt here, DG prompt, that's Drozer. And if I do um, list, I will see all the Drozer modules that you can add. There's a lot of them. Um, and we're just going to use a few of them. So now I install Civ, which is just the same. You download this Civ.apk and just ADB install it. When you first install it, it will fail, saying no matching ABIs. That's what it says when you try to put an ARM code on a phone that only speaks x86. It can't run it. It's the wrong machine language. So what you have to do is put on the ARM translation library, letting your ARM code run on x86. And when you get the right library on there, then when you put Civ again, it will give you success. So I've got Civ on here. And Civ is a deliberately vulnerable app just so you can see it do things. So Civ has a pin that you have to set and a password you have to set. And then it's a password manager, and I put a Twitter password in it, all fake, of course. But the point is, it's, it's intended to be very secure, so you have to make a 16-character password, and then a PIN, and then you store your passwords, and supposedly it's all secure, and of course, the point is, it's not really all that secure. But it's supposed to imitate something like LastPass or something that's handling your passwords. So you put in some passwords, so you've got something to see, which I've already done here. And now, I can find the attack surface. So Drozier here, um, if I run this, this will show me uh, the package it can find named Civ. So that shows me what it's got. And the package is called com mwr example .civ. This is like ADB PM list packages that we did when pulling Android apps off the phone. You have to find the exact name of the app on the phone in order to run further commands against it. So now that we ha have the exact name of the app, we can run package info. And this will tell us information about that package. So it's, it's uh, here's where the data is stored. Data user, here's the APK path. Remember, every app on the phone stores the whole APK, and then it unpacks it and runs it there. So that's how they work for some reason. Here's some permissions. It can read and write the internal storage. It can reach the internet. And it defines some new permissions, read key and can write keys. And we talked about this last time. If you define a new permission, then you control it. And you can choose to make it unrestricted, available to everyone, or available only to manufacturers of the same app, or available to just this app. Uh, anyway, so it defines, that's the start. So here you can do attack surface, which is pretty cool. This will show you the exported activity. So this has three activities exported, two content providers exported, and two services exported, but no broadcast receivers exported. So that's what they call the attack surface. Those are the ways data can come in. And in principle, each of those might be a vulnerability. So we can now launch activities. This will show us the activities that it can launch. And so it has an activity called file select, main login, and an activity called PW list. And the interesting thing here is these sound relatively harmless, like the main activity. This sounds bad, like a list of passwords, and there are no permissions. This ought to be restricted to only people that have logged in or something, or only the, so apparently, everybody can access this list of passwords without having passed through these other stages first, and that's a mistake. So um, file select and PW list look bad. So we can try playing with them. You can launch the activity with activity start. So this is going to launch that activity called PW list. And you can see it's kind of a long command, but all you have to have is this is the Drozier module that starts an activity, and then you just have to have the official name of your app, and then the official name of the activity. So if I go to my phone, which is here, and I just go home, all right, and um, I think I can even probably terminate the app. Let's try that. This will show me my apps. I'm going to kill settings, store, Harvard Health. 
Okay, it looks like the app is in fact already shut anyway. Good. All right, so I'm gonna go home. Okay, so if I run this, it should launch the activity. And the point of this is by using the malware on the phone, I'm able to jump to pages of an app without having to go through the pages in the order in which the developer put them there because the permissions are not set correctly. So I'm just gonna move this down so we can see the phone. When I run this, it launches this, and now I see the Twitter username, which I should not be able to see until I've logged in. Now, I'm not seeing the password yet, but I am seeing the username, and that's an error. It's letting me jump straight to pages without passing the, through the login pages before that. So that's something. So now, we can look at the content providers. This will show us what providers there are in this app. And um, I would like to scroll back, but it's giving me trouble. All right. All right, what is this, garbage? Okay. Uh, all right, it seems to have kicked me out of Drozer. All right, let's start up Drozer again. Okay, then we'll run this again. Okay, so here's my content provider, and here's a file backup provider. And again, uh, no permissions protecting it. All right, and there's the read keys and write keys. Um, notice they don't require any permissions to interact with them except for the slash keys. Uh, let me see if I can explain that. Two content, DB and file backup. Here's DB and here's file backup. And this one limits. So you can only access this path if you have those permissions. These are the special permissions defined for this app. Read keys and write keys. That's the idea. But it only refers to the path slash keys. And uh, the problem, I think, is that you can refer to keys another way. We'll do this a little later. Anyway, so now I'm going to look at find URIs. This is an app to try to, you have to find the path to things that might be interesting. And this is like looking for APIs. This will look for URIs that are just sitting right there. It's not perfect, but it does find content URIs. So there's something called keys with an extra slash at the end, and something called passwords, and something called passwords with an extra slash at the end. And this is what I was saying. This attempted to, up here, this attempted to restrict your access. Boy, my scroll is not working very well at all. This part here attempts to restrict access to it, but it restricts slash keys, not slash keys slash. This same mistake happens a lot in Apache configuration files. You try to restrict the directory, but you don't restrict all the ways to get there. And so there are other ways which are not controlled. So the point is, um, keys requires permissions, but not passwords. And so here we can just launch the passwords activity without any permissions because Drozer doesn't have any of those permissions for SID. Drozer is just a malware. So if we run this one, clear. All right, there's my, something's going crazy wrong with my terminal here. All right. Um, all right. So this opens the passwords and it dumps out the stored data in this provider. And the data is a base64 encoded password and a username. And I have the username. This base64 encoded stuff is still, I think, encrypted or not easily reversed to the password. I've got a hashed password, but I don't have a plain text password yet. So that's a start. But if you get the plain text password, I have to get into the content providers, and that's here. So this one, these are just an attempt to find the vulnerability. These do queries, and I send it a single dash, and now an apostrophe, and now I get unrecognized token apostrophe, and here's a line, select something from password. So this looks a little different, but this should seem fairly familiar as a typical SQL injection error message. Let me just do it again here. The point is you created a line with unmatched apostrophes by giving it a query for an apostrophe. So this is Standard SQL injection, where the apostrophe that came from me is matching an apostrophe that came from the developer. And so uh, this one will do, do it also. Um, looks exactly the same. I think I'll just go ahead. All right, so um, now I can enumerate the table names. And if you've done the other SQL injection projects in the other class, you've gotten used to this. Once you find a SQL syntax error, you then try to find table names and column names with these long queries. And this is what it looks like in Android. You um, pass this for the query, which should look relatively familiar. Star from SQLite Master, 
which is going to give me all the data in the master table, which is uh, contains the structure of the table, the uh, so-called schema, where type equals table, and then semicolon dash dash to terminate the command and start a comment to avoid having an unmatched apostrophe. So this will give me the tables. And there's a table called passwords and a table called key. So those look like pretty good places to attack. And so to get the passwords, I just have to run this and query with my SQL injection, just to ask it to tell me the passwords. So I just star from key. This gives me the pin and the password in the key table from the passwords. So anyway, this is exactly analogous to SQL injection we've done on other kinds of databases. And that's the meat of this stuff. So it looked pretty exciting. And I then went and audited all kinds of bank apps and everything. I could not find anybody who actually made these mistakes, as far as I could tell. So either I'm not very good at doing it, or these aren't that common. But anyway, you do know a lot more about what goes on inside here. So um, all right, we've uh, talked about this stuff. So root and system are accounts that can interact with other components everywhere. They're, 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 and even if they're not exported, that's why we say root privilege escalation exploits are what lets you break out of the sandbox and read another app's data. Only the system is supposed to be able to do that. Um, so if you define a new permission, you ought to make it signature. And that means only apps signed with the same signature can use it. So only the apps from your company can use that new permission. That is probably the best thing to do so other apps don't come in unless you really intend to make a new service that other apps will launch, like Skype. Skype declared a new intent called Skype, and they really meant you could make a web page where the link said, call Skype, and it would call Skype. So they expected to take requests from other apps. And then in that case, they would not want to restrict it this way, but normally you don't want to take requests from other apps. Uh, but this is a fun downgrade attack, and I'll probably add it back to the projects. You have to get make some emulators that are really old to do this. But if you go back, to things before Android 4, this had the problem that the first app that defined a permission would set the security level, and a later app that tried to define the permission would inherit the old security level. So you could put on an app that defines like the Skype or the Twitter permission first, and then when you put on the real Twitter app, it'll have the old permission setting. So you could trick it into making permissions available to everyone, which is pretty cute. Um, this is the kind of thing you'll see a whole series of vulnerabilities like this. This is very much like an XML vulnerability in SAML, where you could make an assertion that was signed, but if you put two assertions and only the first one was signed, it would think they were both signed because the module will check the signature, then passes it on to another module and enforces the actions, and it doesn't notice that there were two actions. So same kind of logic here. It goes to, to turn on the new permission, and it says, oh, the permission is already there. I just won't bother. It doesn't check to make sure the permission is set correctly. It just says, oh, somebody already installed this app. The permission is there. It didn't occur to them a malicious app might define a permission with the same name just to fool you. All right. So intents are these data objects sent to send a signal to another app to make it do something. And the idea is you might get a phone call or an SMS, and then it will send a signal saying, Display an SMS. You might just have the default SMS viewer, or you might have installed some third-party SMS viewer. So it'll send a signal, and then you will choose which um, app to launch. So uh, if you send a signal, start gallery, it will then show a gallery of photos, then it will return. So you, you click something, say pick photo, it then sends it somewhere. Um, so this is how you start it with an intent. Uh, start activity and just define an intent in your Java. Um, so there's explicit intents that tell it exactly which app to send it to. You could do that, but often you have implicit intents where you just say like, play an MP3, and I say, I don't care what player you use, use whatever player this person has chosen to install on their phone. And it might pop up a box saying, you could open it with any of these apps, which one do you want? Or one of them might just be the default. All right, so here's one that displays Android to display web page. This causes an intent, and all the intent says is HTTP. So it says, open this web page, and it doesn't tell you which app to open it in, so it will then just look for browsers and pop up a box saying, which browser do you want to use? All right, so you can have filters. You can define your app, which will take in, your intents can match various things. Say, I only want to see certain kinds of actions or something like that, certain kinds of data. So I can have the scheme is the most common one, where you just look at the start of it, the HTTPS, the Skype, the first few letters are what you use to decide if this intent is coming for me. But you could also look for the host or other things, the port the path, the path pattern, MIME type, the type of data, you could in principle make an intent 
filters that receive signals, but only if they match a very specific pattern. All right, so AM is the Android, and this is what I'm saying, you don't need Drozier. All Drozier is doing is making these commands for you. This AM is the Android man activity manager, and you can send intents here. Um, and you can look them up online in the Google documentation and find the names of these command line commands and exactly how they work to just launch any of these signals. So it's really all open. Once you have a root command shell on your device, you can do everything right from there if you like. Uh, Drozer is just a convenience. So I showed you Drozer and Civ, and you did the attack service, the activity info. Here's the pin bypass where I'm able to see your list of usernames, even though I didn't put in the pin because I jumped right to this page, this activity, without passing through the activities before it. That's a very common flaw in web apps. It's called insecure direct object, object access. You can go directly to the high privilege page without passing through the pages that were supposed to limit it. Um, all right, so slice keys requires permissions, but slice passwords requires no permissions. So we can just open the passwords like you saw. And in SQL injection, you've got a vulnerability, and so you can dump the contents of a table. Once you find the name of a table, you can just dump out all the contents, and then you find the password and the pin in plain text. So um, I tried to find some real-world examples looking out there. Now, there are some old ones. I couldn't find any new ones. Like, I'd love to have you do new real live apps. I can't find any live apps to make these mistakes. Um, but there used to be one here. Like, here's one that required a password to unlock but you could just deliberately send an intent and unlock it. That was a lock screen bypass. By just sending this AM start, you could just send an intent that unlocked the phone. So the lock was useless. Tap jacking is another one. This is the equivalent of web app click jacking. You can put a false page on top of the screen. So when you click on, tap on things, you're tapping on something other than what you think you are. That's a a common attack. These use things called toasts, which are little graphic elements to put graphics on top of things. Um, so you can have a toast, and then you can put up a game that says, pop the balloons. And when you pop the balloons, you're accepting the permissions and installing an app, you know. All right. I see a chat message coming up. Let's see what they got. Okay. Any Home Depot app hacks? Um, I had a project where you did Home Depot, and I gave it last semester, um, and we put Trojans in Home Depot like the others, and the reason I took it off is because the Home Depot app is actually a horrible mess. When you install the Home Depot app, there are like five different versions, and it puts different versions on different phones, so students would do the homework, and they would all end up with different apps. It's a mess. The Home Depot app is like, I think they call that a fat app. It has like five different versions in one container, and I couldn't figure out what the pattern was. So I'd assign homework and students would do it and they'd have this weird app that was not equal to mine at all. So I just took it out and went back to Progressive, which is a simple app. It's not that the Home Depot app is actually more secure, it's just more disorganized. But anyway, you can certainly, as an individual, analyze Home Depot and you'll find the typical flaws. You just can't, uh, I can't publish homework <laughs> step by step with it. Uh, yeah, but I did find uh, Home Depot making these mistakes. Anyway, so, um, the recently used app screenshots, this is true of Android and iPhone. They have screenshots so they can shrink things down. And those might, in principle, have a picture of your screen with like a password on it or something. Although most apps put dots instead of passwords just for this reason, to prevent this kind of stuff. Um, there was a thing called fragment injection at one time where you could change the pin of a phone without knowing the old pin. That's a fairly common attack. This is one of the more common flaws. There's a way to change a password without knowing the old password. That came up on Facebook about two years ago. There was a way to do that. Um, all right. And this just, the same thing, is intent that just jumps directly to this page, new pin, without passing through the page that says old pin. Nope. Pretty simple. All right. And I've got a few cahoots about this stuff, which should be all ready to go. This is 7A. And it's hopefully in my favorites. And there it is. All right. And let me go find my text document to put the winners in. All right. And this looks pretty good. Okay. And I found out last time I now have a variety of music. So this is a vast improvement. We can try funk. Thank you. 
Figured out how to make the wah wah with, uh, with MIDI. I'm pretty sure this is MIDI music. Sounds like MIDI music. This stuff has been around forever because you can do it in almost nothing. This is why Tetris plays it. This stuff is like a player piano. A whole song will be like 10 kilobytes. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. Wave got mid. Can you? I vaguely remember these. Yeah. Yeah, the sound when Windows starts. Oh, yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. All right. So, what component was exported by default? Content providers, they figured you wouldn't have a database except you wanted everybody to see it. By the way, it's not just that Android is stupid. The first iPhone, everything ran as root. There were no permissions at all because there was no app store. There were no apps. The only software was the software Apple put there. So they said, we don't need any stinking security. And it was sort of true at that time. And obviously, the thinking here was that there wouldn't be any, didn't know there would be any malware, malicious apps on the phone, which there totally was right from the start. I got the very first Android phone. And I installed the number one app, and it was malware. And I said, this is awesome. <laughs> so what intent filter can match any part of the day? That's the path. And we're talking about this a lot in the web app hacking class. For some ungodly reason, web apps are not very standardized. So you can write a server that looks for data anywhere. So you can put parameters in the path or parameters in uh, XML structured data or Java script structured data. It's kind of maddening. There's no standard way to do it and you have to stick to that. Like there probably ought to be. So you can use any pattern you want. What's the Drozier module? Lists all exported components. This is my favorite. We need to customize this music too. Okay, that's the attack surface. All right. And what's intent filter at the start of a URI, like HTTPS? That's a scheme, a source of a lot of vulnerabilities in web app hacking. One of the fun things about browsers is there's like 10 old schemes that people have forgotten about, like Gopher, and you can put them in web pages and they will launch god awful old things that haven't been updated in 10 years that are vulnerable. So there's a whole bunch of hacking by obscure schemes. Anyway, um, all right. Check. I know who that is. Adi, I don't know who that is, but my grader might know. And I think that must be you. I can tell from the smile. It looks like you. All right, good. The fox, good. All right, so if Adi is a real name or something close to it, my grader will figure it out. If not, you better let me know. So, uh, that's it for this. I'm going to stop the recording. If I can find it. Here it is. Um, there it is. So, I'll stop. Oh, oh, before I do that, I think I, um, let me say a few words about the last, the iOS projects in case that's not obvious. Uh, um, before I quit, 
let me go here. So we did these and the Android projects. You can totally do the Drozer project if you like, although you will have to get a more modern Android emulator to do it. So now this jailbreak is totally working. And so there are three new projects to do on the iPhone, which are just like what we did on the Android. And um, so the jailbreak was not working, driving us nuts. And the answer is you have to go get the older version of CheckBrain. 0.9.7 beta works. There's a later version that's broken. So just use the old version. It's fun. If you do that, you can jailbreak a phone. <laughs> and, and then you can do this. This is Fiserv. There are two financial, there are two companies that make financial apps, Jack Henry and Fiserv. They both have a whole line of products. They were both phone, they're both the same way, but neither of them would talk to me. But Jack Henry actually patched most of them. I tested them this morning and they were better. So I decided not to pick on them. They seem to be responding to my vulnerability report, although they didn't talk to me. They have in fact updated most of their apps. <coughs> so Fiserv, however, has totally ignored me and not updated their stuff. So here they are. Install one of these apps. There's five vulnerable apps there from banks and they all do the same stupid thing. So install one of these apps and you can use your normal iPhone. You don't need a jailbroken iPhone or anything. And it's not spectacularly dangerous to use this unless you're a customer of one of these banks, but you're just installing a normal app out of the store, install one of these. And then what you do is just connect your phone and look at the log. Now, um, if you have a jailbroken phone, you can just use the console app. I didn't work when I tried that on an unjailbroken phone, so I had to go install this thing called Apple Configurator, which is an Apple product in the store on your Mac. So I don't know why I had to do that, but it worked. And then you can, your phone will just appear. You click on your phone and you can just see the log of your phone. And I thought this is important because it's not much of a vulnerability if it only happens on jailbroken iPhones. The point is somebody could steal your phone. They would not have to jailbreak it or anything. You know, they could just view the log. Of course, um, I don't know how they could sneakily view the log while you're logging in. So you could argue this isn't that much of a vulnerability. But anyway, so now you search for something that to have no hits, and then you just try to log in, putting that in for the password, and you will find the password that logs that information. So anyway, that's all. It's not super fantastic, but that's what it is. They dump passwords in the log, which is about an idea. And if you want to see the vulnerable reports I sent, I put them here. Um, yeah, here. Here's the vulnerable report I sent to Fiserv, and here's the vulnerable report I sent to all these companies explaining exactly what I did. And I even have like a reference for chapter and verse of OWASP telling you don't do this. This is a poor practice. But these guys don't care. And the banks don't seem to care in any way. But we care. So here's another one. This one, you actually have a jailbroken phone. Because you have to look through the local storage. And I don't know an easy way to do that without jailbreaking the phone. You could do it by making a backup and then hunting through the backup. But that's pretty slow and painful. So with jailbroken phone, it gets easier. So here's a bunch of apps that have ignored my vulnerability for more than 30 days, like Great My Professor, College Hunch, uh, this private text and call. Pretty much anything that claims to be secure or private is usually crap. This is what a good, good clue. Um, anyway, so install an app and create an account. Although one of them, you can't create an account, you just have to attempt to log in. And once you just make an account, go through with our account creation and put in a special word for the password and then just grep for that special word. I used a password with SSW6 in it. And here's where it all goes. Private var mobile containers data application. That's where all the data for all the apps is. So I just grep that whole folder and I found the password stored down here and other things like date of birth and all that jazz. So you'll find it. And uh, all these apps have that flaw. So check that out. And here's the plain text network transmission. And again, you do not need a jailbroken app, a jailbroken phone. You install an unsafe app. I had six of these, but two of them actually fixed it. So I didn't pick on them. But these are the people that totally didn't fix it. You can see like this one, four years old. They haven't updated their app in four years. So I think there's nobody home, nobody reading my report, nobody doing anything. Bank coupons, bank corporation, stock trading, and bridal wood. I think it's medical. Anyway, these guys have apps. And all you have to do is run it through BERT. It turns out to be just like Android. You have to join a wireless network that does not have isolation. So you can't use the City College network or the Starbucks network or the Phil's network. You have to you have a plain normal wireless network that lets you talk to other people on the same network. And then you start BERT listening and you set the proxy on your phone just like you did on Android. Click this I here and set the proxy. Um, 
down here, there's a configure proxy on your phone, and then it will just send all the data through. So you just log in and you will find the request right there, sending the password unencrypted over the wire. So this, by the way, Apple announced in 2017 that they were ending this. It would no longer be possible to use unencrypted network transmissions from phones. It is. I don't know why. The latest phone running, the latest version. So there must be more to it, like an asterisk. Oh, except for apps that are more than four years old or something. But anyway, so check it out. It's good stuff. And uh, I'll probably add the other Drozer project in a few more days, and I'll keep up with this. So uh, there were some people that have emailed me and said they can't get any of your emulators working. If any of those people need help, please let me know. If they're here. I can help you. If anybody online wants help, uh, let me know. Uh, let's see here in our chat messages. How will you manage distributing, selling the old iPhones? Oh, yeah. Uh, they're still coming in. Oh, good. Here's who Udi is. Good. Um, I'm, I'm going to have them by next week. I'll have a pile of phones. And then I think I'll just let people borrow them and I keep track of who you are or I'll sell them for 50 bucks because that's about what it's costing me. I think I can keep them coming. Um, we only have two or three Macs to use on campus, so I don't need that many to keep here in the lab. So I'm willing to loan them out. I loaned out three or four last time, and they should all work if you use the right version of CheckRain. And I have another one today. Next week, I'll have at least four or five more. So I'll just keep them moving around so people can play with them. Let me make a note of this uh, person's name. Oh, good. I can copy and paste from here. Life is good. Um, that's this study. Neat. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop the recording. I'll leave the share going for a couple of minutes while I clean up in case there's another